we are at Matthew 24. So the last session, we actually uh, covered a few things. So, um, you know, up till here, actually, you know, all these verses, we have seen internal evidence and external evidence, meaning we saw within the scripture, some of the confirmations of people coming, offering deliverance to them. Some even came to say, you know, signs and wonders. If you remember the example, he said, Jerusalem is going, the walls of Jerusalem are going to fall down and that will be a sign. And when they went out to do that, they were actually ambushed or, you know, captured and killed by the Roman army. Wars and rumors of wars, as we saw, was declared at a time where the Greek said, you no know, Greek word was Pax Romana. Pax Romana would mean, just a minute. So Pax Romana would actually mean the time of peace. You know, why was it called a time of peace? Because Roman Empire was, you know, really peaceful at the time. They had conquered nations. They really did not have much to conquer anymore. So, you know, the Roman Empire was established and there was peace. There was rulership and they were not expecting wars. Then it said more specifically, you know, uh, nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. We saw that famines were predicted by even the Christian prophets. So, you know, we came up till this verse and let's continue from there on. Also, uh, uh, we also saw signs, you know, signs that were given by God, or as Jesus said, you shall see signs and terrible sights in heaven. We saw at least seven signs that were given to this, uh, you know, the Jewish people. One of the significant one was a sword hanging, you know, in the sky right above Jerusalem for 12 months continuously. They saw that, you know, there was in undeniable evidence. We also saw that it was not any star or, you know, any comet or anything because it was stationary. It was not moving and, you know, other, other things, among other things to call it anything else. So they saw the sword and I also showed you, you know, in the Greek uh, or the, sorry, the Roman historians or the uh, Roman empire, how it actually, uh, you know, also issued some coins, which showed the, the sword that was seen over Jerusalem. Okay. The sword star seen over Jerusalem. This is what, you know, they were uh, seeing over Jerusalem. So nobody in their right mind could actually interpret a sword hanging in a sky to be a peaceful thing. Okay. It was very clear that war is going to take place. Bloodshed is going to happen. There were plagues, there were famines, there were earthquakes, there were, you know, diseases, plagues. We also saw how plague affected, uh, you know, those people. But Jesus said, these are just the beginning of sorrows. Okay, just the beginning of sorrows. It is not, you know, time that after this, it's going to happen. Then verse 9, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So this is pretty obvious, right? Christians were persecuted from city to city. And even if you say, you know, Saul or Paul was one of the main uh, uh, highlighted characters who did that from, uh, I think, uh, from chapter 8 to 9, I believe, un until his conversion. So this, this is no question about it, you know, what was going to happen or what was, uh, whether it, it happened or not, what Jesus predicted. Then you saw, you know, historical records also. Then they shall... Many be offended and shall betray one another and, you know, they shall hate one another. So this also we saw. Uh, and Jesus actually says, even within a family, you know, father will rise against his son and vice versa. Children will rise against parents and cause one to be killed and those kind of things. So many were martyred just by accepting the name of Jesus or just by professing faith in the name of Jesus. And this one also we saw, you know, uh, tied in with this. We saw how many false prophets came up and uh, wanted people to follow them. And people were killed, you know, in greater thousands, 40,000, 50,000, 30,000. As they were led by these deceivers, they, they really uh, got killed. So other than that, let us just uh, check a few other things. I just wanted to read out some, uh, you know, some uh, comments by historians and uh, people of you know, uh, reputation. Let me just open the book. 
Okay, I'm gonna just read from over here. Just few uh, comments by people. So talking about Matthew 24, all this occurred in this manner in the second year of the reign of Vespasian, AD 70, according to the predictions of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So Eusebius was a, you know, a, a Christian historian. He lived around uh, 340. Uh, actually, he died in 340. He was born 260 AD. Okay, this guy was a Christian historian. Any notes? Okay, that all the things that are mentioned here were fulfilled. Okay, according to the prediction of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, thousands and thousands of men of every age, who together with women and children, perished by the sword, by starvation, by countless other forms of death. All this, anyone who wishes, can gather in precise detail from the pages of Josephus history. So this is the book I also mentioned to you previously. So he's really saying, you know, you really want to verify if what Jesus predicted came to pass or not. And with the exact detail, you know, just go and read Josephus' books, The War of the Jews. I must draw particular attention to his statement that the people who flocked together from all Judea at the time of the Passover feast, and to use his own words, were shut up in Jerusalem as if in a prison, totaled nearly three million so what was what is actually saying is you know at the time of Passover, as we have also seen Acts chapter two, the Jews from all over the world come for you know for keeping the feast. But at the time the Romans were also outside and they were, you know, they were ready to lay siege to the city, or I believe it was already late, but they allowed people to go in. No one can actually come out, but they were allowing the Jews to go in, you know, to increase the what should we say, the number of deaths or to increase the number of victims. So he's saying, just like Jesus said, he said, they were shut up in Jerusalem as if in a prison. And it seems there were totally three million. This was almost, okay, this is John Wesley now. Okay, I believe we all know John Wesley. Uh, this was most punctually fulfilled for after the temple was burned, Titus, the Roman general, ordered the very foundations of it to be dug up. After which the ground on which it stood was plowed by Turnus Rufus, this generation of men living shall not pass until all these things be done. The expression implies that a great part of that generation would be passed away, but not the whole. Just so it was. He's saying, you know, it was exactly like that. For the city and the temple were destroyed 39 or 40 years after. Now this is John Chrysostom. Um, I believe he's also an early church father. Uh, you can just Google who is. You will preach everywhere. Then he added, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And the end will come. The sign of the final end time will be the downfall of Jerusalem. You know, just like we were studying Matthew chapter 24, verse 2. Jesus said, you know, not a single stone shall be upon another. And uh, he's actually verifying it. Even the foundation was dug up is what is saying John Wesley. So when Jesus said that, immediately disciples says, you know, what is the sign of your coming? When shall these things be? When is the end of the age, end of the world? So he's saying the sign of the final time will be the downfall of Jerusalem. Okay, now this guy is Charles Spurgeon. Okay, let's see what Charles Spurgeon has to say about it. There is a sufficient interval for the full proclamation of the gospel by the apostles and evangelists of the early Christian church and for the gathering of those who recognized the crucified Christ as the true Messiah. Then came the awful end, which the Savior foresaw and foretold and the prospect of which wrung from his lips and heard, and, and heard the sorrowful lament that followed his prophecy of the doom awaiting his guilty capital. The destruction of Jerusalem was more terrible than anything that the world has ever witnessed, either before or since. Even Titus seemed to see in his cruel work the hand of an avenging God. Even Titus seemed to see in his cruel work the hand of an avenging God. Okay. Truly, the blood of the martyrs slain in Jerusalem was amply revenged when the whole city became a veritable Akeldama or field of blood. Now, this is John Lightfoot. 
again, this is a famous person. Hence, it appears plain enough that the foregoing verses are not to be understood of the last judgment, but as we said, of the destruction of Jerusalem. There were some among the disciples, particularly John, who lived to see these things come to pass. Okay, now Philip Doddridge, and verily I say to you, and urge you to observe it as absolutely necessary in order to understand what I have been saying, that this generation of men now living shall not pass away until all these things be fulfilled. For what I have foretold concerning the destruction of the Jewish state is so near at hand that some of you shall live to see it accomplished with a dreadful exactness. Okay, it's actually talking about John, the apostle. So we know, uh, you know, 65, 66, both Peter and Paul were martyred under Nero and all the rest of the apostles as well. John is the only person. He was actually exiled to Patmos and that's when he wrote Revelation, you know, around 66, 64 uh, or 65 between that time span. They tried to kill him. Okay, we all know the story. They tried to put him in boiling oil. He didn't die, so they exiled him to Patmos. So he beat death by the grace of God. So Jesus has predicted, you know, uh, Peter was talking to Jesus and uh, Peter asked, what about John? So if you remember, you know, Jesus says, what if I desire that he be alive until the kingdom come? So that's exactly what happened. John is the only apostle that saw the transition from the tribulation into the kingdom. He actually saw the removal of the old and the establishment of the new. Okay, and great things about the apostle John. Now, Thomas Newton. It is to me a great wonder how any man can refer part of the foregoing disclosure to the destruction of Jerusalem and part to the end of the world or any other distant event. When it is said that so positively, here in the conclusion, all these things shall be fulfilled in this generation. Adam Clark is a famous uh, commentator. You can find it in Esword as well. Uh, this chapter contains a prediction of the utter destruction of the city and the temple, the subversion of the whole political constitution of the Jews, and is one of the most valuable portions of the New Covenant scriptures with respect to the evidence which it furnishes of the truth of Christianity. Everything which our Lord foretold should come on the temple, the city, and the people of the Jews has been fulfilled in the most correct and astonishing manner. Christ informs them that before a single generation shall have been completed. This is a great word. You know, brings more clarity. A single generation, this generation. So this is John Calvin. Christ informs that them that before a single generation shall have been completed, they will learn by experience the truth of what he has said. For within 50 years, the city was destroyed. So within means, you know, 40 years. And the temple was raised and the whole country was reduced to a hideous desert. If Jesus and the early church, okay, this is N.D. Wright, another uh, famous uh, man of God and writer. If Jesus and the early church used the relevant language in the same way as their contemporaries, it is highly unlikely that they would have been referring to the actual end of the world and highly likely that they would have been referring to events, okay, events within space, time and history, which they interpreted as the coming of the kingdom. So the removal of the temple facilitated the coming of the kingdom. Okay, now this is R.C. Sproul is a present day author. In this discourse, Matthew 24, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, and the dispersion of the Jews, all of which took place in AD 70. The uncanny accuracy of these predictions is embarrassing to higher critics. Okay, uh, so you know, just now, uh, the people that I've read, you might have just noted uh, some of the famous people mentioned there. So, you know, out of, very nice. Yeah, out of Asis Pearl is very credible. <laughs> he right. Do you follow him? Yeah, I've read some books of N.T. Wright. Okay. I've read a lot of books of Asis Pearl. Oh, is it? Okay, nice, nice. That's good. Yeah. 
Okay, let's see a few more things. You know, I'm just going to use this book, uh, Great Persecution. Uh, you know, we understand how great the persecution was uh, in the very infancy of the church. These unmerited and unprovoked cruelties began to be inflicted. We know how John the Baptist was beheaded for the testimony of God's word. Then Peter and John, uh, we know how Stephen was stoned and James was beheaded. It's also in the chapter of uh, Acts, I think. Okay, St. Paul pleaded before the Jewish council. And uh, yes, so on. Okay, I'm going to read the last paragraph. At length, about two years before the Jewish war, the first general persecution commenced at the instigation of the emperor Nero, who says Tacitus, this is another historian, Tacitus, 56 to 120 AD, so right at the time of the events, inflicted upon the Christians, okay, uh, Nero inflicted upon the Christians punishments, exquisitely painful, multitude suffered a cruel martyrdom amidst derision, insults, and among the rest were the venerable apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul. Okay, so Matthew 24, 9, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So, you know, this is a great uh, uh, point that is noting. He's saying you don't have to do anything unrighteous. All you have to do is say, I believe in Jesus. Okay, and you will be hated, you will be punished, you will be persecuted. At the end, you know, they're going to try to kill you. So he's saying the hatred which the above recited persecution sprang was not provoked on the part of the Christians by a resistance to established authority or by any violation of the law, but was the unavoidable consequence of their sustaining the name and imitating the character of their master. It was a war against the very name to be Christian was of itself crime enough. Okay, now just uh, let's see one account. So this guy Pliny, uh, Pliny is another Roman statesman and scholar. Okay, at the same time he lived uh, 23 to 79 AD. He's saying in his letter to Trajan, Trajan, uh, okay, since he is the Roman emperor from 98 to 117. But before he was emperor, you know, this is what happened. Uh, I asked them whether they were Christians and if they confessed it, I asked them a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. And those who persevered, I commanded to be led away to death. It is added of all nations. It is added. Sorry if I said there was a disturbance, so I had to meet you. Uh, so, okay, he's saying it is, it is added of all nations. Whatever animosity or dissensions might subsist, between the Gentiles and the Jews on other points, they were at all times ready to unite and cooperate in the persecution of the humble followers of him who came to be a light to the former and the glory of the later. Okay, then the, the next one is you know, in the order. We are going in the order. So the ninth verse was hated of all nations. Tenth is actually, you know, people getting offended, love growing cold, betraying one another. So because of, you know, we just read this one, how they were, you know, really being killed just for bearing the name of Jesus. So many people, you know, they, their love grow cold. So he's saying, concerning this fact, the following decisive testimony of Tacitus may suffice. Speaking of the persecutions of the Christians under Nero, to which we have just alluded, he adds, several were seized who confessed, and by their discovery, a great multitude of others were convicted and barbarously executed. So it could be like this, you know, they catch a Christian and they say, tell me where are the others and I'm going to leave you. Okay. And for his own life's sake, this guy tells their location. Okay. They catch them. They kill them. They also kill this guy. Okay. That is what? Love growing cold. So yeah, there's an author's note. Let me just read that. Matthew 24, 10 to 12. Let me quickly go and see what that is. And many shall be offended and shall betray one another, shall hate one another. Many false prophets shall arise, deceive many. Iniquity shall abound and love of many shall wax cold. So this is what is referring to. Okay. So maybe in reference to the many false teachings of the first century church, which caused many believers to step away 
from the love of Christ into aberrant forms of faith, such as you know, Gnostics, Judaizers, Nicolaitans, and so on. For example, we saw you know Simon the magician the last time. Okay, he was a, a false prophet as well. He was a false Christ as well. He came you know portraying himself to be something great, saying that he's going to do magic and all this. It actually says he bewitched people through magic. But when he sees Peter and James, the, the, you know, he saw that the, by the laying on of hands, the people were receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, he says, he comes and asks him, give me this power. Okay, I'm going to give you money for this. And immediately Peter starts rebuking him, which again was, you know, unscriptural. I, I mean, uh, not new covenant or new testament pattern of what Jesus said. And he curses him. And finally, uh, Simon says, pray that these things do not come upon me. And there is no response recorded from Peter. So this Simon later on went out. Okay, He was coming to faith because of what was happening. He could have been corrected, not you know, judged and outcast. He could have been corrected. But what happened in the end is he went and formed Gnosticism according to history. Okay, The Gnostics that are mentioned here. So that was just a, you know one of the examples of uh, the thing kind of things were happening. We generally think of the apostolic period as a time of tremendous explosive evangelism and church growth. Okay, a golden age where astounding miracles took place every day. This common image is substantially correct, but it is flawed by one glaring omission. We tend to neglect the fact that the early church was the scene of the most dramatic outbreak of heresy in world history okay all this that he mentioned here everything was trying to you know mix itself with christian teachings and perverting it they also stood alone but they also wanted to you know pollute the pure gospel that's why galatians chapter one you know paul rebukes and says if anyone brings you any other message than what i have preached let him be accursed and he repeats i say that again but the problem of heresy was not limited to any geographical or cultural area it was widespread, became an increasing subject of apostolic counsel and pastoral oversight as the age progressed. So, you know, we discussed this recently uh, on a private call. Uh, some heretics thought that the resurrection had taken place. That's why he writes to them that saying that, okay, when Jesus comes, he's actually going to bring, in, bring them back. He's not resurrecting them and taking them out into heaven. Okay, so all the correction had to be done because of the teachings that were being uh, brought into uh, the church. I'll read the you know the last comments. All right, he's just saying the same thing. You know, Hebrews, one of the last letters, was written to an entire Christian community on the very brink of wholesale abandonment of Christianity. The Christian church of the first generation was not only marked or characterized by faith and miracles; it was also characterized by increasing lawlessness, rebellion, heresy from within Christian community itself just as Jesus had foretold. Okay, uh, if you read Paul's letters, you will actually see people, you know, going away or falling away. Also, a man sleeping with his own mother, he says, which is not even heard among the heathen. So everything was, you know, mixing together and it was causing people to stray away. And in some cases, it was causing the mutual love, the love of Christ between people also to grow cold. So after that, let's see uh, what's next. Iniquity, this is done. Verse 12 is done. But he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Okay, this is obvious. Okay. How do you endure to the end? You believe the message that he told you. He said, look, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, just run. If you're on the rooftop, don't even come down. Just run. Okay. He's saying, just run. Go to the mountains. Flee to the mountains. Go to Judea. If you're doing anything, whatever you're doing, just run. And if they paid heed, okay, they were saved. That was the deliverance, you know, saved means deliverance. So now we're going to see actually the end uh, gospel preached in the whole world. We actually saw this previously, you know, all the references. Um, okay, let me just, uh, okay, Romans 1.8, it says, their faith was spoken throughout all the world. And Colossians 1.23 says, Gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. Now this guy Clement, who was a fellow laborer with the apostle, relates of him 
that he taught the whole world righteousness, traveling from the east westward to the borders of the ocean. Eusebius, you know, the historian of the third century, says that the apostle preached the gospel in all the world and that some of them passed beyond the bounds of the ocean and visited the Britannic Isles. And also do not forget about Thomas. He also came to India. Okay, so it was already reached India. It appears, says Bishop Newton, from the writers of the history of the church, that before the destruction of Jerusalem, the gospel was not only preached in Lesser Asia and Greece and Italy, and the great theaters of action then in the world, but was likewise propagated far northward as Scythia, as far southward as Ethiopia, as far as Parthia and India, and as westward as Spain and Britain. And Tacitus asserted that the Christian religion, which arose in Judea, spread over many parts of the world and extended to Rome itself, where the professors of it as early as the time of Nero amounted to a vast multitude. Okay, just this information is amazing. We didn't know, you know, we just read that and we tried to uh, think it is not possible that it was preached in the whole world. But, you know, this guy, where is this? Uh, Tacitus. He was living between 56 to 120 AD. So he was right there when these things were happening. And this guy bears record of the magnitude, you know, the, the, uh, the range or the domain that was spreading into. Okay, uh, the other day, uh, Bijitu had asked about, you know, what words are about the, you know, the gay oikumene and cosmos. So, <clears throat> author's note, the root word oikumene is used for world in this passage actually means inhabited or civilized world, not as in global planet Earth, that would be cosmos. This is the same Greek word used in Luke 2, 1. Now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census should be taken of all the inhabited earth. Okay, I need to check this in KJV. Luke 2, 1. Look at this. All the world... The word here is oikumene, which is talking about the civilized world and by direct implication, the reach of the Roman Empire. So this was, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, this is related to this, you know, and the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. So that's why we're talking about what word is actually used there. Let us also go back to Matthew 24, 14 and actually check. I hope you guys are following along. You know, it's all on the screen. Yes. Okay. Faisal also joined. Hi, Faisal. Hi, Faisal. That? All right. Look at this. Hi. So when it said in all the world, it didn't say all the cosmos. Okay. That can be implied again later on. You know, from Mark, where he says, preach to all creation. Okay, that is there. But the immediate context of what we're discussing is uh, this one. Immediate context is not a single stone will be left upon one another and the end of the age. All right, so. Uh, okay, these are the references. Uh, the Apostle Paul used the same word later to confirm four times that the gospel had been had reached the whole civilized world. Okay, Romans 1.8. Uh, we actually saw this in an other session, but quickly I'm going to jump over it. You know? Romans 1.8 and 10.18. So, uh, Romans 1.8. First, I thank God and so on. Your faith is spoken out throughout the whole world. Okay, now 1018. I say, have they not heard? Yes, their sound went into all the earth or yeah, all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. And then uh, we have two more Colossians 1, 5 to 6. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, 
whereof ye have heard before. Oh, I think I missed. Let me check again. Colossians one five to six. Okay. Yes. Which is come verse six, which is come unto you as in all the world. So he's saying the word has actually come into all the world. And later on, it says it was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Okay, so we just need to pause here and actually reflect. Okay. Temple destroyed. When is the end of the world? When it is preached in all the world, the end shall come. Okay. In the lifetime, the word was preached. And now they were ready. Okay. By the testimony of the scripture, the word was preached to all the civilized world. We also saw some, you know, uh, Jewish uh, statesmen and historians confirming the same thing of the magnitude in which the word was spreading. Now, let's see. Let's go on. Okay, just a note from the book. <clears throat> Jesus was saying that the gospel would be preached throughout the Roman Empire before he would come in judgment upon Jerusalem and the temple. He was right. Okay, he was right. Uh, you know, it has been fulfilled and it has no further fulfillment in our future. We are not waiting for every person to hear the gospel so that the rapture can suddenly take place, okay? This right there should set you free from a lot of bondage, okay? okay they were converging. Look at this, what, what was actually happening there. They had a approaching destruction of the temple, which was prophesied by Jesus, okay? This was a temple, and 30 AD is when Jesus died, and they had a mandate from the Lord that, you know, the gospel should be preached in all the world. So it was like, you know, they were running out of time and they had to do it. They had to do it. Everyone had to hear it. You know, all the, especially the Jewish people, because they cannot say that we have not heard or we don't know that the Messiah has come. The word was given to them. Okay. It was like everything was converging to that particular time and they were really bound. They were really distressed and, you know, Pressed is what the, maybe the right word. They were pressed for time and they had to do it. But now you are not preaching for the end of the age to come or, you know, end of the world to come. The game has changed. Just like I you know, sent a message. We are actually preaching today so that the, you know, end of death may come. Their idea or goal was, you know, the end of the age, the end of the world, the destruction of the temple. But today your idea is, you know, that life may come in because he's seated and he must rule until the last enemy is put under his feet. So for me, you know, it changes everything. Okay, now we have some history about the wars. Okay, this is uh, quite a lot. So, you know, I just hope you can follow along. But, you know, once you hear it, It will be amazing is what I can say. <clears throat> Not that what happened to the Jew is amazing, but truth has a liberating power to it. And, you know, once you know, you cannot be held in bondage anymore. Okay, saying briefly, uh, this is the history. This, this, this is the account. This is the account that history gives of several events and signs that our Lord said would precede the destruction of the holy city. No sooner were his predictions regarding the spread of the gospel accomplished than a most unaccountable state of mind seized upon the whole Jewish nation so that they not only provoked but seemed even to rush into the midst of those unparalleled calamities. So what he's saying is, you know, once the gospel was actually preached in the whole known world, you know, it was like something came upon the Jewish people and everything they were touching it was just leading to destruction. Okay, call to mind 
the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Okay, the law. The law brings wrath. And this is what they had brought upon themselves. Now let's see what actually happened. He's saying, in an essay of this sort, it is impossible to enter into a minute detail of the origin and progress of these evils. But such particulars illustrate the fulfillment of the remaining part of the prophecy. Justify the strong language used shall be presented to the reader. Okay, now, now is the history. From the conquest of their country by Pompey about 60 BC, the Jews had on several occasions manifested a refractory spirit. Okay, he's actually relating from 60 BC. But if you... Uh, if you remember, around 41 BC, you know this, uh, I forgot the name of, uh, just let me check. Yeah, Caligula Caesar, okay, he was the fourth emperor among the 10 kings or the 10 horns. He tried to install his statue in the Jewish temple. But the Jews, you know, as one man, they stood against it and they did not allow it to happen. But from that point on, they had this greater animosity rising within their hearts against the Roman Empire. And there were a lot of short factions, you know, short, uh, what should be short groups led by the so-called Christs, means deliverers, attacking the Roman army, getting killed, and those kind of things were always there. But 60 BC, it took, a, it, it was taken to a whole new level, as you will see. So from the conquest of their country by Pompey about 60 BC, the Jews had on several occasions manifested a refractory spirit. But after Judas, the you know, Golanite and Sadduk the Pharisee, taught them that submission to the Romans would pave the way to a state of abject slavery, this temper displayed itself with, incre with increasing malignity and violence. Rebellious tumults, insurrections became more frequent and alarming. And to these, the mercenary Florus, the Roman governor, contributed a great deal. At length, Eleazar, son of the high priest, who persuaded those who officiated in the temple to reject the sacrifices of foreigners and to no longer offer up prayers for them. Thus, an insult was thrown upon Caesar, his sacrifice was rejected, and the foundation of the Roman war was laid. <clears throat> you know, just to sum it up, they also brought their sacrifices to appease the Jewish God. But, okay, Eliezer, the son of the high priest, this guy persuaded, you know, all the priestdom to reject, say, we are not going to bring your offerings before our God. And just think about it. You know, they are ruling Judea or Jerusalem. The Jews are their subjects, okay, under their captivity. And for these people to say, we are not going to, accept your sacrifices. Okay, that was definitely an insult. So that's what he's saying. This is an event that actually marked something that, you know, like a straight on real war scenario or collision scenario. The foundation of the Roman war, war was laid. The disturbances among the Jews still continuing, Cestius Gallus, president of Syria, marched an army into Judea to quell them. And his career was everywhere marked with blood and desolation. As he proceeded, he plundered and burned the beautiful city of Zebulon, Joppa, and all the villages that lay in his way. At Joppa, he killed 8,400 of the inhabitants. He laid waste the district of Narbatin and sending an army into Galilee. There killed 2,000 of the seditious Jews. Then he burned the city of Lydda, and after repelling the Jews, who made a desperate attempt against him, he encamped at the distance of about one mile for Jerusalem. On the fourth day, he entered its gate and burned three divisions of the city. He may have, by its capture at that time, put an end to the war, but instead of pursuing his advantages or advantageous position, through the treacherous persuasions of his officers, he most surprisingly stopped the siege and fled from the city with great haste. The Jews, however, pursued him as far as Antipatris and with little loss to themselves, slew nearly 6,000 men of his army. After the disaster had fallen, befallen Cestius, the wealthier Jews, say Josephus, 
forsook Jerusalem as men do a sinking ship. And it is with reason, suppose that on this occasion, many of the Christians or converted Jews who dwelt there, remembering the warnings of their divine master, retired to Pella, a place beyond Jordan, situated in a mountainous country. Okay, I don't know if you really caught that. This guy, Cestius Gallus, okay, he was on the verge, okay, came near, he was going to surround and besiege Jerusalem. What would have come to mind to the disciples of Christ? Let us just quickly you know, go and check it out. I think it's in Luke. 16, 16. Luke 16? No, no, before. The one you took before, no, Matthew. 24, 16. Yeah. Then let them which be in Judea uh, flee to the mountains. Yes, this is true. Also, I think it is Luke where it says, you know, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. Let me just also check that. Yeah. Okay. When ye shall see Jerusalem, verse 20, Luke 21, 20. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation is there of is nigh or near. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let them that are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there to, for these be the days of vengeance. That all things, okay, please note, not some of things, okay, there is no pending that is going to be coming in these days. All things which are written may be fulfilled. So uh, let me reiterate, you know, the things concerning Jesus had an end or fulfillment, and they were fulfilled through his work. The things concerning Jews, you know, the, what are these called? You know, the days of vengeance, the great tribulations, they were going to be fulfilled. Whatever was written, it had to be fulfilled. So let me go back to the book. So what he's saying is, you know, uh, so also note this thing. How, how is this guy, Josephus, alive is, is the real question. He's not a Christian. Maybe later on he became a Christian. But... You know, I believe he, has, he was hearing the teachings of the Christians and he realized what was going to happen. He, he, was a, he was an officer with the, uh, the Roman system. Yes. He is telling you how he became an officer now. So look at this. After the disaster has befallen Cestus, the wealthier Jews, say Josephus, uh, forsook Jerusalem as men do a sinking ship. And uh, it is with reason, okay, there is some place where it says, Josephus, right at this time, I don't know if it is right here, but at this time, Josephus pledged allegiance to the Rome. You know, the same time these wealthier Jews and Christians were running away, Josephus also went and pledged allegiance to Rome. So he was recording the happenings from right from the, you know, the event or the ground report is what we will say nowadays, you know, the reporters. But I think uh, we will find that somewhere. I read it. So... Josephus really made a good choice is what we can say. He was able to record everything. So he's saying, on this occasion, many of the Christians or converted Jews who dwelt there, remembering the warnings of their divine master, uh, where is that? Yeah, dwell, retired to Pella, a place beyond Jordan in a mountain country. Okay, he said, flee to the mountains. And that's what they did. There, according to uh, Eusebius, near the spot, they came from Jerusalem and settled before the war. Isn't this awesome? Okay. They came from Jerusalem and settled before the war. Okay, again, you know, showing you that not a single Christian died in the siege of Jerusalem or the destruction of the temple and the city. Other providential opportunities for escape <laughs> afterward occurred, of which it is probable those who were now left behind availed themselves. It is a striking act one that cannot be contemplated by the pious mind without devout admiration that history does not record that even one Christian perished in the siege of Jerusalem. Enduring to the end and faithful to their blessed master, they gave credit to his predictions and escaped the calamity. Thus were fulfilled the words of our Lord, he that shall endure unto the end shall be saved from the calamities that would overtake all those who continued in obstinate unbelief. 
So Matthew 24, 15 and 21. Let us quickly check that. Matthew 24, 15 and 21. 15, okay. Uh, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whosoever reads, let him understand. And, uh, 21, yes. Uh, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. Okay, just like the early Christians paid heed to what Jesus said, we need to pay heed as well. Great tribulation. Never again. Okay, so we are not preparing for a tribulation. We are not to be expecting a tribulation. Okay. That's what we need to understand. All things were going to be fulfilled and they were fulfilled. There is no future fulfillment of the tribulation okay, or the suffering. There is not going to be an abomination of desolation okay, after someone builds a new Jewish temple. Okay, that is not in the scripture. So this great tribulation, as I previously told you, is from Daniel chapter 12. Jesus believed in the scriptures. Jesus quoted the scriptures. He agreed with the scriptures and they came to pass. At that time, Michael shall stand up the great prince which stands for the children of the people and there shall be a time of trouble. So let me read other translations. And there shall be a time of trouble, straightness, distress as was never since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book of God's plan. So let me go back. All right, so we saw the scriptures. Let us continue reading. <clears throat> Nero, having been informed by informed of the defeat of Cestius, immediately appointed Vespian. Now I need to show something here. I think uh, it's going to come at you. Let's, let's see. Uh, yeah, so he was informed in how this guy actually being in a you know on a path of victory did not besiege jerusalem did not try to do that okay we need to call it a divine intervention because if he had ceased then the christians could not go out immediately appointed vespasian who is actually the 10th horn or the 10th king of the roman empire 10th caesar a man of valor to lead the war against the jews he assisted by his son titus Okay, the Titus is the man who finally burned the city and the temple. Assisted by his son Titus, soon collected at Ptolemias, an army of 60,000 men. From there, in the spring of AD 67, he marched into Judea, everywhere spreading the most cruel havoc, devastation, the Roman soldiers on various occasions, sparing neither infants nor the aged. For 15 months, Vespasian proceeded during which period he reduced all the strong towns of the Galilee uh, and the chief of those in Judea, <clears throat> destroying at least 150,000 of the inhabitants. Among the terrible calamities which at this time happened to the Jews, those that befell them at Joppa, which had been rebuilt, deserve particular notice. Their frequent piracies had provoked the vengeance of Vespasian. So there was a particular sect who was, you know, engaged in plundering the goods of the Roman army. They were like pirates, attacking, you know, taking away and running away. The Jews fled before his army to their ships. Now, this is, you need to pay attention to what happened here. So, these pirates, you know, the Jews fled before his army to their ships, but a tempest immediately arose and persuaded those who had set out to sea and capsized them. They, the rest were dashed vessel against vessel, rocks against rocks in the most tremendous manner. In this way, many were drowned. Some were crushed by the broken ships. Others killed themselves. And those who reached the shore were slain by the merciless Romans. The sea for a long space was stained with the blood. 4,200 dead bodies were strewn along the coast and dreadful to relate. Not an individual surprised uh, survived to report this great calamity at Jerusalem. Such events were foretold by our Lord when he said, There shall be distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now look at this. They escaped the, the Romans, but 
immediately there was a <clears throat> what should we say a storm in the in the seas what we can say you know it says a tempest arose immediately the moment they entered the sea a tempest arose and pursued them now in all probability what is the chance of that happening if you know there was already a uh, a storm in the sea or a tempest they would not have gone into it they would have tried to you know find other ways so you know all the curses predicted you know you're going to run you're going to not find a shelter everything is going to work against you so that's what's happening then i'm going to continue reading vespasian after proceeding as far as jericho returned to caesarea in order to make preparation for his grand attempt against jerusalem while he was thus occupied he received news of nero's death so this guy nero died of suicide very young man i think he was still in his teens he, i may be wrong on that okay uh, <clears throat> so some of his plans were rejected by the uh, roman uh, council or you know the assembly and everyone stood against him because of his merciless atrocities you know not just killing of christians but overall and when he saw that he could not prevail against them he decided to commit suicide let's read on not knowing what the will of the future emperor might be he prudently resolved to suspend for the present the execution of this design so what's happening here the second time the armies came near jerusalem and they withdrew back okay again again had to be said you know kind of a divine intervention the people who did not heed the first time this time they got a chance you know to uh, get out of the city thus the almighty gave the jews second respite which continued nearly 2 years but they did not repent of their crimes now this is amazing they did not repent of their crimes neither were they in the least degree repentant but rather proceeded to acts of still greater enormity let me quickly show you what was happening there so you know these all these emperors is that okay this was the guy who tried to put statue in the temple and later on uh, claudius caesar came now it is nero caesar this guy died by suicide so note the uh, the year 68 ad so galba uh, you know succeeded him and in 69 ad he was killed by otto and same 69 ad vitellius killed otto uh, yeah vitellius killed otto 69 ad so how many do you see three three people and if you remember daniel's prophecy you know one little horn is going to swallow three horns so these are the three kings or the three horns that finally vespasian killed vitellius and he uh, he became the caesar of the roman empire okay so this is where you know it was saying 68 ad when they got a two year break because you know this uh, in fighting of the roman empire if you again remember it was like you know uh, iron and clay mixed it is not going to be a stable empire is what the prophecy was a lot of in fighting and all that so vespasian said i don't know what is the will of the new emperor would he want me to take jerusalem or draw back so let me wait until i get news but when people this emperor started killing each other this guy also saw an opportunity and he actually took it i don't know all the history of uh, why he decided to do it or who influenced him but you know that is how it happened so they got a two year period here and let's just uh, continue reading now all right so you know they got uh, some relief from outward uh, attacks or the outward wars because the vespasian stopped now look at what's happening just like they ran away from the roman army and they were killed by the storm in the sea look what's happening here the flame of civil dissension again burst out with more dreadful fury in the heart of jerusalem two factions contended for sovereignty and raged against each other with ruthless and destructive animosity a division of one of these factions having been excluded from the city forcibly entered it during the night a thirst for blood inflamed by revenge 
they spared neither age, sex, nor infancy. And the morning, behold, 8,500 dead bodies lying in the streets of the holy city. They plundered every house. Having found the chief priests, Aeneas and Jesus, they not only killed them, but also insulted their bodies by casting them forth unburied. They slaughtered the common people as unfeelingly as if they had been a herd of the vilest beasts. The nobles, they first imprisoned and scourged, and when they, when they could not, by these means, convince them to join their party, they bestowed death upon them as a favor. Of the higher classes, 12,000 perished in this manner, and no one dared to shed a tear or utter a groan openly through fear of a similar fate. Death was indeed the penalty of the lightest and heaviest accusations, and none escaped through the lowness of their rank or their poverty. Those who fled were intercepted and slain, and their carcasses lay in heaps on the public roads. Okay, this is not the Romans. This is Jews killing the Jews. Okay, note that. L look, look at the one of the name of the uh, chief priest, Jesus. Uh, yeah, th there was also a false prophet called Bar Jesus. Uh, last session we saw that. Bar Jesus is son of Jesus. It's amazing. And uh, yeah, so those who had fled were intercepted and slain, and their carcasses lay in heaps on the public roads. Every symptom of pity seemed utterly extinguished, and with all respect for authority, and with it all respect for authority, both human and divine. While Jerusalem was a prey to these ferocious and devouring factions, every part of Judea was cursed and laid waste by bands of robbers, robbers and murderers who plundered the towns. In case of resistance, they killed the inhabitants, not sparing either women or children. Simon, son of Gioras, the commander of one of these bands of 40,000, with some difficulty entered Jerusalem and gave birth to a third faction. Okay, as if two were not enough, now a third gang joined to fight. Thus the flame of civil discord blazed out again with still more destructive fury. The three factions rendered frantic by drunkenness, rage, desperation, trampling on heaps of slain people, fought against each other with brutal savageness and madness. Even those who brought sacrifices to the temple were murdered. This is amazing. <laughs> Okay, they don't even allow them to worship. Even those who brought sacrifices to temple were murdered. The dead bodies of priests and worshippers, both natives and foreigners, were heaped together, and a lake of blood stagnated in the sacred courts. John Levi of Giscala, who headed one of the factions, burnt storehouses full of provisions. Okay, I think by now you need to understand that these people are not in their minds. Okay, who would burn storehouses? Who would kill, you know, priests? Who would who would stop worshippers from bringing sacrifices? Okay, you can read all the manifestations from, you know, Deuteronomy 28. And uh, it was just out of control is what we can say. So John, John Levi burnt storehouses full of provisions. Simon, his great antagonist, who headed another of them, soon afterward followed his example. So, you know, John as a gang and Simon as a gang, because John burned the storehouses, this guy, Simon, he also burned the storehouses. Doesn't make sense, right? This is, uh, this is actually bewildering. <clears throat> Thus, they cut the very sinews of their own strength. At this critical and alarming conjecture, intelligence arrived that the Roman army was approaching the city. The Jews were petrified with astonishment and fear, and there was no time for counsel. <clears throat> no hope of pacification, pacification, no means of flight, means no place to run away. All was wild, disorder, perplexity. Nothing was to be heard but the confused noise of the warrior. Nothing to be seen but garments rolled in blood. Nothing to be expected from the Romans but exemplary vengeance. A ceaseless cry of combatants was heard day and night, and yet the lamentations of mourners were still more dreadful. The consternation and terror that now prevailed induced many inhabitants to desire that a foreign foe or a foreign enemy might come and affect their deliverance. Such was the horrible condition of the place 
when Titus and his army presented themselves and encamped before them. But alas, he came not to deliver it from its miseries, but to fulfill the prediction and vindicate the benevolent warning of the Lord. When ye, shall, when ye he had said to the disciples, when ye see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and Jerusalem surrounded by armies or camps, then let those who are in the midst of Jerusalem depart and let not those who are in the country enter into her. For then know that the desolation is near. These armies, we do not hesitate to affirm, were those of the Romans who now filled the city. From the time of the Babylonian captivity, idolatry had been held as an abomination by the Jews. This national aversion was manifested even against the images of the Roman gods and emperors, which the Roman armies carried in their standards. So, you know, just like uh, we understand that, you know, some faiths worship pictures, you know, they, they frame the pictures and worship the pictures. So not a, just a statue, but a picture is also a worshipable idol. So what he's saying is the idol worship was abomination. And because the Romans worshipped even their emperors, you know, they had their statue, they had their pictures on flags as well. So the Roman flags that they were carrying, you know, as they were walking, had the images of their gods and had the images of emperors who was esteemed to be a god. We see this in an earlier time of peace when Pilate and afterward Vitalius, at the request of some eminent Jews, avoided marching their forces through Judea because of this very reason. So he's simply saying, just they carrying those flags is considered as an abomination, according to the Jewish people, because they're carrying images of their gods and the so-called emperor gods. The desolation disposition that now governed the Roman army, the history of the Jewish war, and especially the final demolition of the holy city, present an awful and prime example Jerusalem was not merely captured, but its celebrated temple was laid in ruins. So he's saying by comparing Matthew 24, 15 to 16 with Luke 21, 20, you know, the verses that we saw previously, we, under, we can understand that the abomination that caused the desolation of Jerusalem was the Roman soldiers that lay siege to the city. Fortunately, Jesus told his followers that when they saw this, they should flee for the mountains. They did this because they understood what Jesus said. Both Chrysostom and Augustine, the early church fathers, wrote agreeing that the abomination that caused the desolation was the Roman army. So Chrysostom was 347 AD. Uh, he said, for this, it seems to me that the abomination of desolation means the army by which the holy city of Jerusalem was made desolate. And, uh, you know, St. Augustine 354 AD in North Africa says, Luke, to show that the same abomination spoken of by Daniel will take place when Jerusalem is captured, recalls these words of the Lord in the same context. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed about with an army, then you shall know that the desolation thereof is at hand. So let me try to uh, bring more clarity to this phrase. Okay, abomination of desolation. Or it is actually better said okay, desolation is simply destruction okay real great destruction so just you know as we just now mentioned you can actually find this in many old testament uh, references Okay, the idols or idol worship was abominable and the Roman Empire was carrying pictures of their gods, pictures of emperors which are equal to gods 
according to them okay also their shields may also have carvings i'm not sure of this but you know normally they have some pictures on it as well so this is uh, i'm putting x questionable but he said you know when these people came near to the city the roman army was the abomination because it was carrying idols okay that was the abomination okay the roman army was the abomination and what did it cause okay it caused destruction or desolation desolation of what temple and the city okay just think about if they are entering the holy city which is actually marked as a city of the living god and they bring their own idols okay the abomination was marching in the streets the abomination was right at the gate the abomination surrounded the city and finally it entered the city after destroying the walls of jerusalem and uh, also history says that once the destruction of temple was done titus son of the then emperor vespasian the 10th emperor okay he sacrificed pig cow and goat sorry ox pig ox and goat okay pig is an abomination again so in different ways you know it was uh, manifested or uh, happened is what we can say the same act daniel chapter daniel chapter 8 uh, there was one guy called uh, antiochus epiphanes he also destroyed the temple and he sacrificed uh, a pig there okay that's the sort of uh, information from uh, the historical so the abomination that caused the destruction or the abomination that caused the desolation was the roman army and it was also described in okay it's it's next i'm going to read that okay lest however the army of titus should not be sufficiently designated by this expression our lord adds okay he's saying as if that was not enough the lord adds wherever the carcass is there the eagles will be gathered together the jewish state indeed at this time was fitly compared to a carcass the scepter of judah its civil and political authority the life of its religion and the glory of its temple were departed it was in short morally and judicially dead the eagle whose ruling instinct is rapine and murder fitly represented the fierce and sanguinary temper of the romans and perhaps it might be intended to refer also to the principal image on their ensigns okay if you remember the image of the babylon okay just like they have mascot today in teams okay mascots or logos as we can say in different context the principal ensign of the roman empire was a flying eagle okay again it fits the same expression the eagles will be gathered there uh, the principal image on the ensigns however obnoxious to the jews was the eagles which were at length planted in the midst of the holy city and finally on the temple itself authors note in other words the emblem of the eagle was upon the roman shields and banners also jerusalem was pictured as a dead carcass so common one commentator says uh, the words in this verse are proverbial vultures and eagles easily a certain where dead bodies are and hasten to devour them so with the roman army jerusalem is like a dead putrid corpse its life is gone and it is ready to be devoured the roman armies will find it out and as the vultures do okay dead carcass will come and devour it the day on which titus encompassed jerusalem was the feast of the passover and it is worth noting that this was the anniversary of the memorable period in which in which the jews crucified the messiah so you know if you really want to uh, 
have a greater image of god we need to understand the numbers in daniel were very exact okay just look at the you know the sovereignty or the it amazes me how god got it right many many years ago the exact dates the years and so on things will happen jesus was crucified right before the passover okay can someone confirm that on the day of the passover or before the passover okay it was the passover the lamb of god is crucified for us uh, so exactly 40 years from there you know 70 ad we come to the scene of the finishing of the entirety of all the prophecies it is worth noting that this was the anniversary of the memorable period in which the jews crucified their messiah at this season multitudes came up from all the surrounding country and from distant parts to keep the festival how suitable and how kind then was the prophetic admonition of our lord when he said let not them that are in the countries enter into jerusalem actually lot of them would have gone to jerusalem thinking temple is there god is there and god will protect them no absolutely also you know it reminds me of a rebuke in the old testament you who do not keep my covenant you know why do you quote it to me something like that i'm just remembering i think it's in psalm somewhere uh, they don't keep the covenant but they want to claim the promises of god the protection and all that okay but god is gracious but in this specific case you know it had to be fulfilled it had to be removed and the only way out was if you're going to you know really come to faith in Christ Jesus again it's not for god that they had to come it was for their own sake you know that the spirit of god can speak to you speak to those people and you know uh, deliver them from the coming destruction author's note uh, george peter holds for book does not address match 24 15 18 20 then then let those who are in judea flee to the mountains let no one on the house top go down to take anything out of the house let no one in the field go back to the get their cloak pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the sabbath i am not sure why he skipped this section okay that book that he's quoting does not cover this but he's saying here jesus was giving very practical advice to his followers about how to stay alive during the ad 70 destruction we can tell from the passage that jesus was speaking of a local destruction flee judea okay again it should confirm to you not the end of the world because he would have said everyone from everywhere need to flee somewhere this is very specific flee judea a historical setting not on a sabbath the natural tendency upon seeing an approaching army would have been to flee into jerusalem for safety yeah that's right okay because their walls were really strong they could have thought you know uh, inside is a safety but jesus told them to fight their natural instinct and flee the city because of jesus's command to flee his followers were protected history does not record that even one christian perished in the siege of jerusalem the members of the jerusalem church by means of an oracle given by revelation to acceptable persons were ordered to leave the city before the war began and settle in a town of perea called pella okay awesome this is amazing the spirit of god spoke to a person and told them go you need to go now we also saw you know the friday session that even the jewish people you know as they were in the inner court of the temple they heard the voices let us depart hence and the voices grew stronger and you know they kept on hearing so god made every effort to reach you know these people that were going to perish the high priest heard the words let us go away from here let us depart from here they saw the sword hanging on the sky they saw an altar you know the the light shining on a particular place in an altar for half an hour they saw that a virgin lamb was actually bringing forth a virgin heifer was bringing forth a baby right before they tried to sacrifice it and so many other things it mentions there you can you know uh, check out the last session 
it's amazing after so many signs you know uh, still uh, they perished to pella those who believed in christ migrated from jerusalem and as if holy men had utterly abandoned the royal metropolis of the jews the entire jewish land the judgment of god at last overtook them for their abominable crimes against christ and his apostles completely blotting out that wicked generation from among men so this is said by eusebius the 3rd century historian you know uh, 300 ad then albert barnes is a commentator it is said that there is reason to believe that not one christian perished in the destruction of that city god having in various ways secured their escape so that they fled to pella where they dwelt when the city was destroyed yeah so i'm really sure you know for the people who rejected him and did not want deliverance god gave so many signs how much more he would have guided his children you know of the coming destruction it is remarkable by it is remarked by several interpreters which josephus takes note of with surprise that cestius gallus having advanced with his army to jerusalem and besieged it on a sudden without any cause raised the siege and withdrew his army where the city might have been easily taken by which means a signal was made and an opportunity was given to the christian to make their escape which they did accordingly and went over to jordan as eusebius says to a place called pella so that when titus came a few months after there was not a christian in the city i find this historical fact alone to be incredible proof that the first century believers knew that jesus was speaking to them about the AD 70 destruction okay uh let me just uh, even the translators of josephus works noted means whoever translated josephus works into english there may be another very important and very providential reason be assigned here for this strange and foolish retreat of cestus which if josephus had been now christian he might probably have taken notice of also and that the affording jewish christian in the city an opportunity to calling to mind the prediction and the caution given them by christ about 33 years and a half before that when they should see the abomination of desolation the idolatrous roman armies with images of idols in their ensigns ready to lay jerusalem desolate stand where it ought not or in the holy place when they should see jerusalem compassed with armies they should flee to the mountains by complying with which uh, those jewish christians fled to the mountains of perea and escaped the destruction nor was uh, nor was there perhaps any one instance of a more unpolitic but more providential conduct than this retreat of cestius visible during this whole siege of jerusalem which was yet providential such a great tribulation as had not been seen from the beginning of the world to that time no not ever should be so we are also going to escape i mean sorry not escape examine other things that are mentioned you know as we go on but for today i think we can stop here and you know we can uh, we can just talk or discuss oh this is just- so we can just say that it was a local event like in and around jerusalem yes yes 70 ad yeah because the judgment was coming upon the city the people and the temple remember the daniel you know the way it was phrased you know thy people and thy city so the jerusalem was okay. the real center of uh, spiritual activity for the jews wherever they were they had to come to jerusalem for passover so the city and the temple was destroyed Okay. and the end of the age what we are telling is basically the old system coming to an end because christ had done the ultimate and the perfect sacrifice yes right yeah. okay